So thanks and welcome everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Al Schlinsog. I get to be your uh, MC basically for today. Um, these guys have all the, the really good ideas. I like to say they're the brains and I'm the beauty, but that's <coughs> clearly not true. But I'm going to kick us off. Um, so welcome. We have a lot of things we want to cover today. Um, most importantly, I'm worried about this microphone, so if you can't hear me, let me know, okay? Um, most importantly, we have beer, and hardly anybody's drinking it, and it's really disturbing me. So if you can, if you'd like, help yourself. You don't need to wait until 5 o'clock. But seriously, we have a lot of goals that we want to accomplish today. Uh, we put our heads together and thought of things that we thought, that, you know, that we thought maybe you'd want to hear about. But we also know very well that there are things that you want to hear about that we didn't consider. So please shoot your hand up, uh, <clears throat> you know, holler out a question. We're very happy to take that on on the spot. And the more interactive we can make this, the more fun it's going to be, to be, to be really honest. The last thing you want is to hear me drone on uh, for 20 or 30 minutes. So let's try to keep it as interactive as we can. Um, see, a couple of little announcements. We did apply for CLE, for those of you that are admitted to the bar. You don't need to fill out a sign-up sheet. Um, if you're here, we know that by virtue of your name tag being missing from outside, so you're automatically going to get the two hours uh, registered by us, so that's, that's all fine. So um, <clears throat> one of the other things in addition to learning a little bit about product liability law is to learning, uh, you know, meeting each other and learning a little bit about um, everyone who, who assembled here, because we actually have a really cool group of, of folks from different segments and different industries. So make sure that you meet each other, and I saw a lot of talking going on beforehand. Um, so I'm not going to force you to like meet your neighbor, you know, like they do with some some things. But make sure you hang around if you can for a few minutes when we're done. Have a cocktail then if you didn't have one now, and uh, we'll have a couple laughs together. So let me introduce uh, your panelists. The guy at the top, I think, was, is me. Uh, probably lots of hair and 20 pounds ago, but um, sadly I don't quite look that way anymore. I worked, cut my teeth uh, doing some time at Jenner and Block back in the old days in Chicago. Um, Jen Nagger is a senior associate in our group, sitting immediately to my left. If you can't tell from her uh, photo, she just waved at you. Um, she's from Mayor Brown in New York, also big firm experience. Patrick Hodan has, uh, has been homegrown here at Reinhardt and practices, uh, I would, wouldn't say exclusively, but greatly within the product liability arena and knows more about recalls in particular than anyone I've ever met. Matt. And Colleen Filco is going to be speaking last, um, sitting next to Patrick. And she's also uh, got a little big firm experience from Cat and Mutant Firm in Chicago as well. So all of us except for transplants, or I'm, I'm sorry, all of us except for Patrick are transplants, um, which is kind of tough in a way. So here's what we're going to be doing today, and I know you know all of this already. Um, the point I want to make is that these folks really know their stuff. And honestly, we get up every day and we come here because we're really trying to make the world a safer place. Now you're all thinking, that's corny, okay? <laughs> but it's true. We're really trying to help you guys, if you're in-house counsel, risk managers, uh, and, and make safer products. And why is that important? That's important because guess what? If you do that, what happens? you have fewer accidents. And if you have fewer accidents, you have fewer claims. So that makes you more profitable, more successful. Your business is going to be, you know, run much more better. Um, and what we're left with then, when those claims do get made, because they will get made, is we're left with cases where somebody screwed up. Uh, you know, the plaintiff misused the product, or it wasn't maintained, or, you know, God knows what went wrong, but it prob probably wasn't our fault. So again, that makes your company stronger. It makes us better lawyers or seem like better lawyers because we have easier cases to defend, right? So we all win-win. But we really are trying hard, and this uh, presentation is a perfect way to try to help us all get on the same page in terms of partnership to work together where, uh, to build better and safer products. Our bread and butter, honestly, is in defending lawsuits. But we're all better off if we don't have to do that. So that's what we're after, and that's what these guys are going to help you with. 
So what I'm going to do is get us started by talking a little bit about uh, general product liability principles. I'm just going to lay down the framework and then basically talk to, you, talk to you about the mines and the minefield. And that's why you've got this photo here. Because we know where most of the mines are buried. And I'm going to identify those mines for you and then Jen, Colleen, and Patrick will show you the path through the minefield. And again, as, the, as these concepts pop into your mind as affecting your industry or something particular about your industries, you know, please let us know and we'll address those things. So what is product liability law all about? Taking it way back to the basics. And I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. I, I know you're all familiar with this. <clears throat> but the, the bottom line on the public policy is that it's unfair to subject people to products that are, un, quote, unquote, unreasonably dangerous. There are dangerous products everywhere. Can you be sued for, for an injury because of them? Probably not. The question is, are they unreasonably dangerous? And if they are, then the courts would find them to be, you know, quote, unquote, defective, which then leads to liability. Forgive me. <clears throat> so the, the first question we really need to tackle, and I'm taking this in reverse order, instead of talking to you about claims, and elements, which boils down to defect, and then what does that mean? I'm going to talk to you about defect first. I'm going to work our way backwards. So what does it mean for a product to be defective? Well, uh, there are two tests that the courts typically employ. One that we like a lot on the defense side is called the risk utility test. It's basically a balancing test. Does the benefit of the product outweigh the risk of using it? This is very defense friendly. Other courts use consumer expectation test, where they leave it to the jury to decide, is that more dangerous than an ordinary consumer might think? That's how those jurors usually come out under that test. You know, this is a, this is a very plaintiff-friendly test. The reason I give you both of these is because some states use one or the other. Some states use both, and it's very confusing. So as a product manufacturer that sells all over the United States or all over the world, what are you supposed to do, right? It's very difficult when you're looking at these two tests to try to determine what are the guiding principles. Well, there are some guiding principles. And the most uh, obvious one is that uh, unreasonable danger does not exist if the hazard is open and obvious. So, you know, a knife, a sharp knife. Is that dangerous? You betcha. Is it unreasonably dangerous? No, it's not. Okay? The hazard to be unreasonable has to be latent or hidden within the product. So the shallow swimming pool, is that a latent hazard? It might be, but not if you've got a label next to it on the patio. Uh, what about the chainsaw? The rotating blade, is that open and obvious? I think so. But what if there's something inside the housing of the saw that broke that allowed the chain to fly out? Is that obvious? Eh, probably not. Okay, so is it open and obvious? Danger. Similarly, sophisticated users are important because they may appreciate the hazards more than uh, somebody else. And this is actually relatively new in a lot of state courts. Wisconsin has adopted the sophisticated user defense, but it basically means that if you have specialized knowledge about a certain product, you probably know about that hazard and appreciate it better than somebody who doesn't work with it. So it's a corollary. So it's a corollary. Some additional things you ought to know, real basic, statutes of repose. Um, these are interesting statutes. They're state-by-state state creations. You're probably familiar with statutes of limitation which say, in essence, that a certain number of years after an accident happens, you can't file a lawsuit. Well, statute of repose is a little bit different, but it has the same effect. It says that a certain number of years after a product was sold, you can't file a lawsuit. And one of the, the leading examples is a tractor that might be in existence for 40, 50, 60 years sometimes. So in Wisconsin, if a product was sold 15 years ago, you cannot have a reasonable expectation that that sucker is still going to work right. Okay, it wears out. And the courts have said, as a matter of law, you're charged with that knowledge. So you can't sue anymore. So again, statute of limitation runs a number of years 
in most of the claims we're talking about, here's three years from the date of injury, the date you got hurt. But a statute of repose would be 15 years from the date the product was made and sold. So for those of you that have, uh, you know, long life products, that's very important. Assumption of risk, again, you know, we talked about this a little bit with the sophisticated user doctor, doctor and somebody who knows what they're getting into. You know, if you're walking on hot coals, <laughs> you know what you're getting into. Okay, so you can't sue because uh, the, the coals are too hot. Kind of a silly example. Um, another guiding principle is that how can we make a danger or a hazard not latent? Remember I told you that for a hazard to be defective, it's got to be latent or hidden. Well, how do you make it undefective? Make it unlatent. Make it, make it open and obvious. So how do you do that? Well, warnings, labeling, instructions, training. Um, this can all be done in your uh, contract documents. It can be done uh, in, you know, the stickers on the product. It can be done in any number of ways. But highlighting the hazard actually makes the product not defective. So what are the product liability concerns that you can control? The way you're going to get sued if you're going to get sued is for a bad design, defective manufacturer, or failure to warn. And the plaintiff's lawyers almost always look at it that way, in that order. They want to tag your design first. You should have made it with this safety device or with this guard. And if they can't come up with anything with an expert to show that the product was designed wrong, then they're going to come after how it was made. And how it was made would be, well, you know what, you designed it right, but it just came off the line the wrong way. <clears throat> so in our example here, you've got a ladder that, that the rung broke off of, maybe because somewhere along the manufacturing process, a screw didn't get put in or something like that, okay? So it was designed right, but it was made wrong. You can be sued for that. Now, even if it was designed right and made correctly, then they're going to get you for failure to warn if they can. So that's why you have to try very hard to make sure that, you know, not only your design's right and you're manufacturing it well, but that you've warned all over the place for any latent hazards that you're aware of. So those are the three kinds of claims, um, or bases for claims, I should say. Now, the way they're going to manifest in the law is they're going to sue you for strict liability and negligence, primarily. Strict liability focuses on the product. It's not about you, okay? It's almost the sole question. I'm making this really oversimple, of course, but it really boils down to uh, is there a defect in the product and did that cause the plaintiff's injury? And we've got a photo of an old Pinto where the, you may remember the, the gas tank was basically attached to the bumper, you know, <laughs> and I'm exaggerating, but <clears throat> if you got rear-ended, the thing was going to blow up. That was a bit bad design case, but if you are strictly liable, if the product is defective, you will be strictly liable um, for anything that occurs, any injuries that flow from that defect, if you put it in the stream. stream. That applies to, I should note, manufacturers, uh, distributors, component suppliers, everyone in the stream of commerce of that product. Um, even innocent uh, box passers, you know, the Walmarts that have the generator in the box. It didn't do anything to the generator except take it off the truck, put it on the shelf, and put it in the shopping cart. They can be sued for strict liability too. Now, negligence is different. Because negligence is going to focus on, on you now. This is on your behavior. What did you know? What should you have known? What should you have done? How could you how did you fail in designing it? How did you fail in manufacturing? It's all about your conduct. So you have to establish that there's a duty of care, the duty was breached, proximate cause and injury. Those are the basic elements. But the distinction is that the focus is on your behavior. And then failure to warn, as we've talked about, is simply um, do you have a product out there that has a latent hazard that you didn't warn about? Or, stated otherwise, was the warning inadequate or insufficient? Big debates on these cases. This is really the junk science of, of product law because any plaintiff's lawyer can come up with some kind of a failure to warn theory. 
and you'll say, well, wait a second, look right here, we had a warning right in our label, and uh, there was one on the product. And they're going to say, well, sure, but I never saw that, or I didn't understand what that meant. Um, and then what do you got to do? Then you got to bring in all these experts, communications guys, to say, well, that's crazy. And they'll have someone to say, oh, no, that's exactly right. You know, no one would have understood what that meant. So uh, failure to warn claims, that's the third big area. It's the squishiest area, um, but it's the area where we find most claims when you're doing your job really well, when you're making a, designing and manufacturing a great product. It's almost always going to be a failure to warn claim. And when that happens, you should take heart in knowing that the plaintiffs are really grasping at that point because they don't have anything solid to get to. Get to. So now as to the warning, like I said, it is kind of squishy, this area of law. So what does that really mean? Well, there's four essential points. You need to prominently and clearly inform the user of the nature of the hazard and the consequences of not following the warning. So prominently means it is someplace where you're going to notice it. It is not buried in the manual, okay? It is not, and a lot of us have manuals with, you know, on page 6, 19 or 27 different warnings. Um, you know, is it there? Yeah, but is that very prominent? On the one hand, you would say yes, because we have this whole section that says warnings, but on the other hand, someone's going to say, yeah, but it was buried in, you know, number 18 of 27. I didn't read that far. You know, it didn't catch my eye. So it's got to be prominent. It's got to be clear, meaning it's got to be understandable, simple. Um, and you have to talk about what is the hazard. You have to make the hazard obvious, patent, okay, not latent, and the law requires you to also describe the consequence of not heeding the warning. So are you going to break your neck if you dive in the shallow pool? You need to describe what's actually going to happen. Otherwise, many courts will say, yeah, you had a warning, but it wasn't good enough, okay? So just to recap very briefly, as to strict liability, fault is not an issue at all. Um, the question is, was the product defective when it left your possession? Now, I'm stressing the timing on this because I'm going to get into something else where it's important. When that product left your facility, was it defective at that time? Negligence, fault is the issue. So in addition to finding that the product was defective, um, did they find that you were negligent, did the jury find that you were negligent in designing, manufacturing, or warning about the product? Did you fail to act as a reasonably prudent manufacturer would have acted? And as to the warning, I think we pretty well covered that. Is the hazard latent? Is the warning sufficient for the reasons that we just described? Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the edges of this, though. I've kind of shown you where the mines are, so where are some of the pathways around them? What are some of the defenses? And some of these we've covered. So the statute of repose, you'll remember, is basically nothing lasts forever, and the courts have just said you cannot expect that that thing is going to last any longer than fill in the blank X number of years, depending on the state that you're in. 10, 15, 20, depends on the jurisdiction. Um, is it an open obvious hazard? Did they assume the risk? Sophisticated, there's my first typo, <laughs> sophisticated user is supposed to say. Um, is there a learned intermediary? This applies in the drug and device context primarily where you can say, you know, as a, as a drug manufacturer, we communicate with a doctor. And the doctor has to decide whether or not that product, that medicine is right for you. We don't talk to you, we talk to your doc. So the doctor is the learned intermediary, which kind of takes the role of the sophisticated user. They know enough to know and appreciate the dangers or the hazards. So is it, again, it goes back to, is it a latent or hidden hazard? No, not when you're dealing with a physician. Some other areas, obviously you want to blame the user or a third party whenever you can. They misuse the product. Did you comply with standards, ANSI, uh, OSHA regulations, agencies, FDA? Was it state of the art? Is there any better way to make the product, or is that it? It probably is. So if you can say that there's no better design, that's an awfully good defense. 
a few others. Preemption. This is technical, but basically the idea here is that the federal government regulates what you do and how you do it. And they do it in such a way that it's so complete that you don't have discretion to do anything else. So if somebody complains and says, hey, uh, I'm, you know, I, I got hurt because your product was made with that thing on it. So, well, we had to put that thing on there. The federal government makes us. Or, you know, they say your label was bad. And this comes up in the drug and device world all the time. Well, yeah, but guess what? The Food and Drug Administration made us say that on the label. You know, how can we couldn't change it if we wanted to? So those are pretty good uh, preemption defenses in those contexts. Misuse. We never knew that you were going to grind up that stool into powder and drink it. You know, or whatever they were doing. But people use your products in kooky ways, and I'm sure you've all got a thousand great stories that we can trade about how that's gone down. Um, the biggest and most fruitful in most of our cases is just the failure to maintain the property if it's a piece of equipment. Uh, because once you sell it, I'm sure you sell it with maintenance and instructions as to how to uh, use it and care for it. And probably none of your customers follow those rules very well. Um, so failure to maintain comes up quite often in our cases uh, when we find that you know, it wasn't a product defect. It was just the thing was broken because they didn't take care of it. And if they had taken care of it, the accident never would have happened. Okay. So that's the basic, really basic stuff on product liability law. But now there's something new that kind of turns all this on its head. What I told you before about the timing, you may remember I said what matters is how does your product look when it leaves your facility. Traditionally, that's when product liability ceased. At the time you sold it, your liability was over. Doesn't mean you couldn't ever be sued again. You could. But when the question was, was it defective? That was measured at the time it left your facility. When the question was asked, were, did you do something wrong in making your product? Or should you have known to do it differently? Your knowledge was measured at the time it left your facility, okay, and then it stopped. But now there's a post-sale duty to warn. And this, again, is a state-by-state -state creature, and it's a little bit different, but has been adopted by most states now, that basically says that if you learned of a defect after you sold the product, after you sold the product, and if it's reasonable and feasible to warn somebody who's already bought it in the past, you have to go and do that. So think about your products right now. Is it possible for you to reach out and warn the consumers to have those things? Do you even know where they are? Um, how would you do that? Do you have to go through your supply chain or your, uh, your distribution chain? Forgive me. I mean, it's very difficult. So there, this is a complex analysis as to whether or not this duty exists. And it would depend on, on a number of facts that we don't, don't really have time to get into today. So let me give you an example of why this is so important. So let's say you've got a product that was sold two years ago and somebody gets hurt and they file a claim today. So now, traditionally, what are you going to be asking? Well, uh, two years ago when that thing left our facility, was it defective? Could, could we have designed it any differently then? Maybe we make it differently now. But at the time, was it state of the art? Um, so the bottom line in that case, the traditional case is, you know, whether you knew or should have known of a problem at the time you sold it two years ago, okay? Now, here's where it gets interesting. Let's say five years from now, you've got another one. It's the same kind of accident. Now what are you going to be asked? Well, you're going to be asked the same stuff. Why didn't you warn me at the time of sale, okay? But you're also going to be asked, well, wait a minute. Five years ago, when that happened the first time, why didn't you warn me then? You had a post-sale duty to warn. You had, at that point, you could say you didn't know about the danger when you sold it, but a couple years later you sure did because you had an accident and somebody sued you over it and said that the, prob the product was defective. So at that point, you should have come and warned me. And why didn't you? Now, this case gets really challenging because the fact is you did have a case, okay? And we get these cases a lot. You did have a claim. Maybe it wasn't a lawsuit. 
but maybe somebody called in and complained that the thing wasn't working right. What are you doing about that? And how are you going to have the evidence five years, ten years from now to defend yourself? Um, so what do you need to do? Well, you need to thoroughly evaluate the credibility of incidents when they occur. So somebody says, hey, I had this terrible thing happen to me. Your first reaction may be, ah, you know, that knucklehead uh, did, did something wrong. Okay, maybe true. But you've got to do this in a credible way to figure out whether or not the claim is feasible or credible. Because if you don't, and if you take it too lightly, that's going to look very badly. Then what you need to do is you need to document what you've decided. We've either decided that it is credible or it's not. We're going to warn or we're not. And if you're not going to warn, that's fine. Put in the reasons in some kind of a document. Put list the people that came up with that decision. Now, I'm telling you to create documents here, right? And probably a lot of you have little flags going off and you said, hey, I thought, you know, we're not supposed to create documents like this. You're not. But in this case, I encourage you to do it because I'm going to give you a war story and then I'll get back to this. Um, we've had cases where we, uh, our clients were sued for making or not making a change to a product. We had a, a feature that was, to spare some of the details, let's just say it was a, uh, an option, an optional feature that later became mandatory. And of course there was an accident in between that time period before it was mandatory where somebody got killed. And the claim was, you know, you knew it was a safety device that would have prevented this accident. You should have put it on the product. And we'd ask our guys, well, what do you, what do you say about that? And I'd say, well, I'm pretty, pretty sure we didn't put it on because, um, or we did finally put it on as a, as a standard speech feature. Everybody was asking for it, but not because of safety reasons. What do you mean by pretty sure? Well, that was Bob and Bob's dead. I mean, it's a true story. Bob's gone. There's not a single document in the entire company that proves why or why not we made this change. So as a defense lawyer, it's pretty tough. You can't go into court and have the guy testify that I'm pretty sure that that's the way we would have done. He can try, but it's not going to get you very far. So you've got to have some kind of evidence if, say, I'm not around, if you're not around, um, none of the decision makers are with the company anymore, how are you going to reach back five or ten years and pull out the evidence that's going to prove that you did the right thing five or ten years ago. You need to have some kind of a file. Now I say, um, you know, you put that all in your memo, you send it to your legal counsel, we'll preserve it as best we can. It's not guaranteed to be attorney-client privilege, but there's a darn good argument for it, so it'll be protected. But then you need to modify your document retention policies too, okay, to either say that you're going to preserve or not preserve this kind of information because if there's an inconsistency there, that's going to lead your opponent to, to track it down. But it's very important, bottom line is, it's very important when you get a claim in now that you assess the credibility of it, you think about and you do this with your engineers, we, you know, we put together very complicated protocols for some of our clients where they, they really try to figure out could this have happened the way they claim. And if so, okay, well what should we do about it? Do we need to redesign our product? Do we need to send out a warning? Do we need to send out a, a bulletin um, to make corrections? And if we're going to send out a warning, um, how are we going to do that? How are we going uh, to reach the right people? And how are we going to know that we reach the right people? You need to monitor and track compliance. Because if you don't have that, you're kind of doomed anyway. Because what's going to happen is your customer is going to, or your client, your plaintiff, I should say, is going to say, well, it's nice that you did all that, but guess what? You never warned me, so apparently you didn't do a very good job of it. Um, so, but if you have really good records of how you implemented that post-sale warning, you're going to be able to bat that case down. But this is something that not everyone is doing, and I really encourage you to take these steps. It's going to save you tons of money and heartache down the road. So, bottom line. Uh, this can arise at any time. It may arise after you've left your company. Um, but you need to have a protocol, a written protocol, that you can employ that's going to protect yourselves. Okay? It's complex. It depends on your own systems. You're all equipped to do that, but if you need some help, just give us a holler. We'd be happy, happy to do that. 
So in the last couple of minutes I've got here, how can you manage your risks? Um, you know, evaluate the product liability risk that you've got. And these guys are going to talk about all that, but do a product safety review. Um, audit your claims and your exposure. Take a look at your contracts, upside, downside. Look at your insurance. I'll just throw in, you know, do you want a self-insured retention? Do you want a deductible? There are big differences between control of counsel, control of the case. Um, lots of horror stories where uh, clients have had major deductibles, you know, million-dollar deductibles, and uh, the insurance company had control of the case, and the company, the clients, did not want to settle. They wanted to try the case. But the carrier could settle it for less than a million, okay? So they did because then there was no risk that that case was ever going to get into the carrier's level. So you really, you can get at odds with your carrier if you've got an SIR or if you've got a deductible with a high limit. Recall policies. Take a look at these, please. This is my one kicker. Um, a lot of you probably have recall insurance. These policies are all so different, you have to have to look at them to know what they say. We've had bad, bad situations where, um, sorry, I, I'm eating up your time, I apologize. One, one case, okay, I'll tell you about it. Uh, manufacturer of steering components, you know, power steering system, uh, the component went bad. They were installed in millions of vehicles around the world. We had to do a recall. Client said, hey, no problem, we've got recall insurance. I said, oh, thank God. Send me the policy, let me take a look. Guess what the policy provided? It said it would cover the cost of sending the note to the consumer saying, you got a problem with your steering. That was it. It didn't pay for getting the car back or the new component installed, nothing. You know, they actually paid more in premium than they got in benefit from that particular policy. But the, the, the horror story is, they didn't know that because they didn't read it. Either. So you got to make sure that you look at these policies because they're all completely different. And then if you get claims, defend them. Do your best to defend. And how can we help? We can talk to your teams kind of like we're talking to you now. There's lots of different topics we can cover, um, and we can cover topics that you would like that maybe we haven't listed here or we're not going to talk about today. So just give us a holler. We're happy to do that at any time. It could be over lunch, it could be over a morning or an afternoon, whatever makes sense for you. So again, back to the minefield, what we're talking about today is just the proverbial tip of the iceberg. You don't, we can only touch on a little bit, but there's a whole lot of risk here. And the only way to fully understand it is to dig very deeply. And once you do that, then you can navigate, you know, around this entire iceberg or navigate through the minefield. Sorry for talking quickly. Any questions for me before I turn you over to Jen? Yes, sir. One Jen. question on the um, when you use the word claim, does that mean you have a complaint? Yeah. Or is it just a, a new claim? So I, I, yeah, so the question, we're recording this, Vince, so I'm going to repeat it. The question was uh, when I use the word uh, claim, could that be basically anything? And the answer is yeah, it, it can be. Anytime somebody's complaining about your product and saying it's not working the way it's supposed to, that's something you need to assess. Obviously, you're going to draw the line somewhere. Your team's going to say, ah, you know, how many resources are we going to expend on this particular question? Are we going to assemble the whole safety team, et cetera? Depends on the claim. But yeah, you should be looking at everything at some level. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. The question is, uh, what happens if you're a component manufacturer, but you're in compliance with specs basically to your customer, right? Um, there's two things. One is, you've got a great um, situation with your customer, okay, your OEM, because you've made it per their specification, but you have no defense really to the ultimately injured consumer. They can still sue you, but what you can do is, because of your contract with your OEM, hopefully you can go to them for indemnification or defense. Or if they won't defend you, you could sue them and say, well, this was really your fault. But it's not easy to just step out of the middle and put those two parties together. You're kind of stuck in it.
Good point. Yeah. Uh, no, no. The, step, the warranty could stop claims sooner. The, uh, I, I'm sorry. The, the question was, does the <coughs> length of warranty impact the statute of repose? And I guess the proper answer is yes or no. Uh, from your perspective, the length of the warranty could terminate a claim uh, sooner. Uh, generally, that would terminate a contract claim, not necessarily an injury claim, but it would be sooner than the statute of repose. But it doesn't change the statute of repose at all. I believe so. Yeah, I'm not. <clears throat> I've not seen an official answer to that, but I think that that would take that outside of the policy of the statute of repose and and make you liable. Yeah, there are some state. states that have those laws. Good. Well, thanks, Jen. Um, what do you do when something fails? Good afternoon. Again, my name is Jennifer Nager, and I'm part of the product liability team here at Reinhardt. Imagine this. Your company's worst nightmare has come true. Uh, you've just learned that one of your best-selling products has been involved in several deaths across the country. What do you do? How does your company respond? In this instance, time is of the essence. If your product is involved in a defect or failure, you must act quickly. Your company must act within 72 hours of learning of this product failure. You can't just sweep it under the rug and hope it goes away. It's only going to exacerbate the costs and liabilities to your company. You must act quickly. Today I'm going to be talking about what actions your company must take within 72 hours of learning of a product failure. This includes implementing a crisis management plan, assemble a crisis response team, communicating with outside counsel, notifying your insurer, <coughs> getting an investigation of the product failure, and considering whether to notify the relevant regulatory authorities for recalling that product. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of all of these issues. The first action that we recommend that you take is implementing your company's planned and hopefully tested crisis management plan. And we recommend that you develop this plan way before a crisis even occurs. Hopefully you all have this plan in place right now. You want to draft this plan long before a crisis occurs because as you know, when a crisis comes around, it's going to drain your company's resources, it's going to come without warning very quickly, and if you do not manage it properly, bad things can happen to your company. There can be long-term effects to your company. So you want to develop this plan way in advance if you want to successfully weather this crisis. Your company's response plan should have three goals. To manage the immediate risks, to end the crisis quickly, and to restore the company's credibility and reputation in the market. Now you can accomplish these goals by having an understanding of the risks that your company faces. And you can anticipate these types of risks beforehand when you're developing this plan. Think about the types of risks your company are likely to face should a crisis occur. Examples of these crises are product recall, investigation by a regulatory authority, a plant shutdown, or prolonged supply chain interruptions, just to name a few. Now to have an effective response plan, you should include the following things. In this plan, you must identify your core response team. And I'll get a little bit detailed more about the response team in a minute. In your plan, you must identify outside counsel. We recommend that outside counsel always remain a part of your core response team for reasons that I'll explain. And this outside counsel should specialize in the type of risks that you anticipate your company facing should a crisis occur. You want to identify a company spokesperson. Who will be the face of the company when a crisis occurs? You can either hire someone, an outside consultant, or appoint an internal person. 
You also want to develop in the plan the key messages that this company spokesperson should deliver to the media at a time of crisis. As I'm sure you're all aware, the media will pursue aggressively product safety, product recall stories. And oftentimes, stories get out by the media before you even had a chance to determine what happened in a product failure. You want to beat the media to this by presenting a cohesive front and having a good story to tell to the media. You want to shape public opinion before the media does. Now, it's important that you have a carefully crafted plan on how you want to speak to the media. You want to include common themes in your message, basic themes that you can plan ahead of time and craft for the, for the crisis that you might face. For example, your company puts safety first, product at issue is designed to improve lives, and that you performed extensive safety testing on the product and it has a good safety profile. These are all themes that you want to put in your plan ahead of the crisis so when the time comes you're not thinking of this on the spot. Also include talking points in the plan about the specific products at issue, the products that your company develops, manufacture. For instance, an example is that your product has been on the market since 1990 without any issues. Along those lines are the sort of key points that you want to have relating to the products that you develop. The plan should also refer to your company's document retention policy. I'll mention this earlier. Every company should have a document retention policy. How do you preserve documents should a claim arise? Your crisis management plan should refer to that document, should indicate how to alert key personnel to save responsive documents. You want to make sure that nobody is throwing away documents or destroying documents in a time of crisis. And it may not be something that people are planning to do. Maybe an automatic email or deletion policy that your company has in place. You're going to want to have notes in your crisis management plan that says to turn that off. You never want to be accused of destroying documents or facing sanctions in a court because of destroying documents. It would be well uh, planned in advance. And in addition to preserving documents, your plan should also refer to the document retention policy to notify people of what to include in emails, what not to include, more importantly, in emails before and, importantly, after a crisis occurs. Avoid sarcasm, avoid humor, avoid speculation if you don't have a founded opinion, avoid exaggeration or emails that say, I told you so. It's often, you see those often and they will be the first thing that the media refers to, the first thing that your plaintiff will put up as an exhibit. It's hard to imagine, but it happens all the time. So it's always good to remind personnel what not to include in an email. Now, you have developed a crisis management plan. What do you do next? It's important before a crisis occurs that you follow through on that plan and make sure that it works effectively. It's not good enough to just have a plan on paper ready to go when a crisis happens. You need to practice annually to make sure that you are doing the right things in this plan. Test the plan by conducting live drills or role playing. Say a crisis occurred, your product has caused deaths throughout the country, what do you do? Assemble a response team and go through what your company would do if a crisis occurs. And also, have annual strategy sessions. Recommend that you get the response team together, think about different product recalls that have happened throughout the country that year. How would your company have responded to that? May have been different. How would your company responded differently? May have put you in a better position than the company that it happened to. So it's not enough to just have a developed plan. You need to make sure you test that plan. Test the strengths and the weaknesses and make sure that the response team knows exactly what they're supposed to do. Talking about this response team, the second action we recommend that you take within 72 hours of a product failure is assembling this crisis management team. When you first develop this, you make sure that you identify the members of this team. Don't wait until the crisis occurs to notify those people that they're part of the team. Again, that's all part of the, and being involved in the strategy sessions and taking role playing so they know what their, their responsibilities are should a crisis occur. You want to make sure that you include key representatives from all areas of your business. And some examples here that I've listed are management, 
product design or engineering, manufacturing distribution, quality, safety, marketing, and legal counsel, both recommended in-house representative as well as outside counsel. It's important that you include these core members so they can communicate to the rest of the company what the core response team has decided, what decisions will be made in order to manage the crisis. We recommend that you keep this group relatively small in the beginning, and based on the crisis, you can always add additional members. And importantly, choose a team leader before the crisis occurs, occurs because that team leader will be responsible for assembling the team and coordinating the response plan throughout the, the time where you're managing it. The third action we recommend is involving outside counsel early in the crisis to minimize risk to the company. If you choose outside counsel that has a multidisciplinary practice, often you can handle all different aspects of the crisis. And some I've listed here are, have listed, are regulatory issues, restructuring issues, civil litigation, among others. It's important to have a specialized outside counsel that is familiar with your company in all these areas. Now often, Company personnel have the mistaken belief that all communications with in-house counsel are privileged, and this is not the case. It's very important to remind personnel that all communications are not privileged. In-house counsel serves a business role, and they serve a legal role. So if you have communication with company personnel that's focused primarily on business advice or management advice, that is not going to be privileged. Often, because of this role, it puts communication outside the scope of the privilege. If company personnel or in-house counsel are unsure of whether or not they're conveying privileged information, pick up the phone, have a call, or go to a person and have an in-person meeting versus putting it in writing. Because again, anything you put down is going to be used in litigation, should that come. Now, there are many cautionary tales, but one that I think is particularly important was a 2012 federal case, United States v. Halifax Hospital Medical Center, where the judge ruled that hundreds of emails and other documents that were created or directed to the in-house counsel were not privileged. The court held that outside counsel enjoyed a presumption of privilege protection, but in-house counsel did not. And most of these emails and communications were with the compliance department. And the court held that even though this compliance department was acting at the direction of in-house counsel, mainly the communications were business and advice related, management related, so they were not privileged. And all of that was turned over to the plaintiff. So you need to make sure that the court held that email that listed an attorney and a non-attorney in the two lines was not privileged because it shows that you're seeking business and legal advice. And I'll go over some tips as to how to keep communication and house uh, counsel privileged, but one of them would be to not put business and legal people on the two lines, separate them out. Something as simple as that, the court held it was not privileged. And of course, the primary purpose needs to be to seek legal advice, not business advice. Now with outside counsel, it's going to be much more likely that you're Communications are going to be privileged because the sole purpose usually of hiring outside counsel or bringing outside counsel uh, into the mix is for legal advice. And outside counsel doesn't provide usually the same sort of business advice that in-house counsel would. So that's a, one of the cautionary tales too is to include outside counsel in your core response team early on so that investigative analysis, communications you have regarding investigation will most likely remain privileged. And again, the burden will shift to opposing counsel should this go to litigation and they have to prove that your communication was not privileged if you have opposing counsel on email versus in-house, the in-house counsel need to prove that it was, that you were seeking legal advice. And this is all part of that Halifax decision. Now what is the scope of attorney-client privilege with outside counsel? As I stated earlier, the primary purpose needs to be legal advice. You need to make sure you state in your email purpose of is to seek legal advice. It's not sufficient just to include an attorney on the email or to invite an attorney onto a conference call or to a meeting to discuss business advice because courts will dig deeper into that. They will often prefer to look at substance over form and, and say that it's not enough that you just include an attorney on the email. 
Now, if you need to communicate with in-house counsel via email or uh, written correspondence, a couple tips to keep that privileged. Um, and this is all based on a Halifax decision that was really important that decided a few years ago. You want to limit communication to strictly legal matters. If you want to communicate about a business matter, make sure you separate out those emails. One email be about biz, uh, legal and the other email be about business. Don't put them together. Also recommend that you label communications attorney client privilege confidential information. This shows an intent to keep it confidential. And you want to limit communications to the scope of your employee's work. Any personal communications or any communications about personal lives is not going to be confidential, it's not going to be privileged. And lastly, limit the audience to those absolutely necessary for this particular communication. Don't throw 20 people on the email or 23 people in the CC line of a memo and expect it to stay privileged. And to keep only those people you think are necessary. Now the fourth action item we recommend that you do within 72 hours of a product failure is notifying your insurer. And we recommend you notify the insurer of any circumstances that could give rise to a claim. First, you want to have all of your, this should be part of your response plan, having all of your relevant insurance policies together in one place so you don't have to go digging for them, asking your insurer for them at the time of crisis. Have them all in one file folder with the plan. And we also recommend that you forward those to outside counsel. Have them review them even at the time of crisis if necessary to see if it's something that would give rise to a claim. But usually we recommend that you err on the side of caution when notifying the insurer because you don't want the insurer to have an excuse that it was late notice or something like that. Now like in-house counsel, it's important to remember that communications with the insurer may not be privileged. And this is going to depend on the jurisdiction. Even if you're talking about a defense, they may not be privileged. In Wisconsin, the courts have held that communications between an insured and an insurer are not privileged. So when you're emailing your insurer, when you're calling them by claim, be careful what you say, be careful what you talk about especially if there are unresolved coverage issues. We're going to talk to your outside counsel or in-house counsel about how to discuss that with the insurer first. And number five, and this is one of the most important parts too, is within 72 hours of a product failure, you're going to want to begin your investigation of what happened. It's going to be impossible to complete that investigation, but you're going to want to begin it um, as soon as possible and you should involve your product designer in that investigation. We also recommend involving outside counsel in that investigation so you can keep your analysis privileged. As part of the investigation, schedule your visit to the site. Schedule a visit of the accident scene as soon as possible. Again, you may not get there within 72 hours of, it, of your discovery of it, but set it up because time is always very sensitive in these instances. And when you're at the scene, you want to photograph the site, Make note of any accident damages or changes in condition to the product. Make note of if there's been any maintenance issues with the product, like does the product have replacement parts. Photograph any warnings or instructions on the product or at the scene. And you also want to obtain the names and contact information of any people that are present at the accident and present during the time of your, your inspection and investigation. And very importantly, and again, this has happened many times, is that companies do not secure the product at issue. They do not preserve it. Um, there are instances where you know, there's a defect of a tractor, a defect of a big um, part, and they don't save the actual defective part. It's important later on, if you are sued in litigation, that you've got that part to show. So make sure that you, if you can't secure it right away, that you contact someone, see how you can go about securing it. You also want to secure original packaging. If you have a smaller product, packaging instructions any warnings that were on the original product. You want to start your research of the product line. You're going to need to determine how many products were affected and is this going to be national, is this going to be a regional or local in scope. And in making this determination, you should obtain the maintenance history, service bulletins, design files, showing any drawings or specifications, warnings, instructions. You should also begin researching the actual product that failed. In doing this, you should obtain the model number and the serial number, date of manufacture and ownership history. 
Also, you want to identify witnesses to interview. Who was there, again, at the accident? Who was present? Who witnessed it? Again, this is all going to be time-sensitive time information. If you don't get this information as soon as possible, memories will fade, people move, people pass away. You want to learn the eyewitnesses to the accident, maybe insurance investigators or cleanup crew, maintenance personnel. And if it was a bad accident, maybe first responders, anybody who was there. You also want to identify local dealers, distributors, suppliers. And another time-sensitive information is gathering media accounts of the accident newspaper articles, any uh, news TV coverage, or social media um, that was captured, captured social media that from any employees that were there and may have posted about it. And you obtain a copy of the police report and the weather report for the day. And know that's a lot of things. Um, we have a checklist that we can provide to you that identify all of these items. If you're interested, we can provide that to you. That should be a part of and maintain that checklist as a part of your response plan. Now, the last item that you should consider within 72 hours of a product failure is notifying relevant regulatory authorities and or conducting a product recall. 72 hours is not a lot of time to make that decision. So obviously, you should complete your investigation first before you make that decision. But it's something that should be in the back of your head when you're conducting your investigation. You may have a legal duty to report. But just because you do, it doesn't mean that you will have to recall all of your products. It's part of the investigation. And this is going to be a good transition to my next speaker, Patrick Hodan, who will be discussing reporting and product recalls. Does anyone have any questions for me? Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Where did 72 hours come from? Um, it's just something that we think that based on um, you know, the past experiences that we had, that it's something if you wait any longer, sometimes people forget about it, sometimes they don't act right away. So we just recommend that that's how you act as soon as possible. It's not a set time that it came from case law or anything, it's just based on experience. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, the question you had on accident investigation sure. or investigation, does Reinhardt recommend that? Yes, I think, I think um, that all of these investigations, going to the scene, talking to all of I think outside counsel should be a part of. It, saves, uh, it helps you in your analysis at the end. They can go back and talk to other company personnel. It saves privilege. We recommend that they're there for the whole time. Thanks. Anybody, anybody else? If I could, I would follow what my uh, Jesuit high school teacher used to tell me about the three Bs, be brief and be gone. But uh, unfortunately, uh, because you have CLE credits, we have to go a certain uh, length of time. Uh, I'm going to talk about recalls and your reporting obligations. Uh, but before I do that, I'd, I'd like you uh, has anyone here, if you could raise your hand, ever been involved in a recall? Just a few. Uh, has anyone ever been involved in reporting a problem to a government agency? So this is going to be relatively new for some of you then. Uh, and let me give you some context in, in terms of how you need to be thinking about your reporting obligation. But before I do that, uh, I, I want to tell you that I'm going to spend most of the time uh, talking about your reporting obligation to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, or the CPSC. Some of you in the room uh, may be manufacturing products or selling products that aren't governed by the CPSC. It may be medical devices or governed by other governmental agencies, and you may be thinking this is your time to nap. Uh, I would suggest that uh, perhaps the same reasoning that goes into reporting to the CPSC uh, will also go into other considerations that you're going to have when you have an issue. And it might be worthwhile to, to at least listen to some of this. Generally, the, the issue arises, uh, or at least your antenna ought to go up with respect to reporting or a recall uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, a consumer complaint comes in, that's very obvious. Uh, 
perhaps you had an expert look at your product for a reason, one reason or another, looking at the design. Perhaps you're thinking about redesigning your product. Uh, you may have a quality control report that comes in that shows there's the potential problem. Uh, you may have a study. Uh, you may get hit with a lawsuit. Uh, there are any number of different ways that the issue can arise, uh, and it can come in through many different avenues. Uh, and so the company as a whole needs to have tentacles reaching out to keep its ears open so that you know you might have an issue. And when one of those reports come in, there are really two issues that arise at least with respect to consumer products. One, do I have to report? And two, do I need to recall? I'm going to spend most of our time talking about do I need to report because generally speaking, uh, whether you decide to report or not is ultimately going to influence or help you decide whether you need to recall your product. First thing is uh, if you know you're covered by the CPSC, the first question you've got to ask, or you don't know whether you're covered by the CPSC, is, geez, do I need to report to them? Well, practically speaking, there's a very easy way for you to figure that out, generally speaking, without picking up the phone and calling your lawyer. Go to their website. Uh, you can go to their website, you can scroll through that, and you can see every company that's ever reported a recall and you can see every product that's ever been recalled. Uh, and you can then access at the same time uh, all the information they have on what's included in a recall, uh, what you have to provide as part of a recall. Very, very informative website. I will tell you this, the CPSC's reach or their jurisdiction <coughs> is very long. Uh, they regulate more than 15,000 products. Uh, if your product reaches the hand of a consumer or has an effect on a consumer, uh, the CPSC will likely say you're governed by uh, its jurisdiction. There are some notable exceptions, obvious exceptions, automobiles, drugs, uh, some commercial products. You know, if you're selling uh, a forklift, to a commercial entity, you're probably not regulated. The CPSC has sent out or, or set forth a very complex regulatory framework uh, to make products safe and, and to keep uh, end users safe. And one of the most important weapons it has is its reporting obligation. It's called the Section 15B. And Section 15B applies to manufacturers. Manufacturer is also defined to include component manufacturers. So those of you sitting out there who are component manufacturers that think you don't have a problem, you're just going to lay it onto the manufacturer, you're wrong. You also have an obligation. It also applies to distributors and retailers. And essentially what 15B says is, if you have a product that fails to meet a safety standard, by and large, your product probably doesn't have a, a government safety standard to worry about. But if, if you do, and it fails to meet that standard, you've got to report. Or if you have a product that creates a substantial product hazard, you've got to report. Or if it creates an unreasonable risk of injury, you have to report or if it fails to comply with any other rule or regulation or standard, you have to report. Now that's great. Uh, those are a lot of fancy legal uh, terms that we could all debate, uh, you know, what do they mean? Uh, what's an unreasonable risk? Uh, what's a hazard? Uh, unfortunately, there's only one reported decision in the United States that gives us any indication of what that means. And that's a decision out of the Ninth Circuit. And for the lawyers here, you may appreciate, that, appreciate this. The Ninth Circuit is probably the most liberal jurisdiction uh, in the country. And uh, you would expect 
a liberal interpretation of your reporting obligations. And in fact, uh, that's Miranda. Uh, and Miranda uh, sets a very low threshold with respect to your obligations. You may ask, when I, you look at a product, do I have to report? If this is uh, an unreasonably dangerous product, you say, well, I can sleep at night. You know, I don't have a problem. Well, the case from the Ninth Circuit says, it doesn't make any difference what the company thinks. Or you might think, well, you know, I'm not sure if it's a substantial product hazard uh, or uh, I need to report it. Um, maybe I should go out and get an expert. And, and I'll rely on that expert. Well, the Maramba case says it doesn't make any difference what your expert believes. Maramba stands for the proposition that it's what a reasonable person believes. And you, in order to understand that, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the Maramba case. And I think it's, it's a must read for, um, for anyone who, who is in the position at a company that is responsible for recalls. And Maramba is a case where a company uh, was distributing electric appliances. And one of the electric appliances that they were distributing was this juicer. And they sold 30 to 40,000 juicers. They got a report back in 2008 that one of their juicers had exploded. And so this is a juicer that had been manufactured in China by a Thai Taiwanese company. And they, they got an expert in-house to look at it. And they fussed with it and tried to see if it would explode. And of course, uh, they couldn't <coughs> replicate the inc incident. And they thought, well, maybe there was uh, consumer abuse. Uh, and, and they thought, well, maybe this thing had been put in the dishwasher. Uh, so they didn't do anything about it. And then a couple of weeks later, they got another report uh, of an exploding juicer. Uh, think of your popcorn maker, you know, with that plastic on the top. These things were just exploding, uh, sending shrapnel all over the place. And for about six or seven months, and we can all laugh now, every week, every month, they got another report. Uh, and at the end of it, 22 people were injured. Some required hospitalization. There was, I believe, one uh, surgery. Uh, and they didn't say anything to the CPSC. Eventually, a customer reported them. CPSC got involved and said, listen, when did, when did you start figuring this out? I said, well, we looked at this, but we didn't think it was a problem. We couldn't replicate uh, the incident. Uh, we don't know how this happened. Uh, and we had an expert. Uh, surely, you can't find us in, in that particular case when we had an expert look at it, and the CPSC sued them. And they went out to the Ninth Circuit, and there was a lower court decision finding that we don't care what you think. Standard doesn't care what your expert thinks. It's what a reasonable person would think. And we would think certainly after 22 people have experienced an exploding device that a reasonable person would assume that your device is defective and unreasonably dangerous. Now, you're probably not going to be quite in that situation. Sometimes there's going to be, it's going to be obvious to you, we, we need to report this. You know, this. This is a problem. We've had lots of these incidents come up, we've got to report. Or you may look at it and say, look, if this isn't an issue, we don't have to report. It's the close calls that are really the ones that are most difficult. Because ultimately, you're going to have to rely on your judgment, uh, you're going to seek outside counsel. You're going to seek the advice of in-house counsel. You're going to see what other people have done uh, in the past. The problem you have when it comes to reporting <coughs> is, in all likelihood, the CPSC probably believes you should report. And in their regulations, they say, when in doubt, report. All right. Well, what happens if you don't report? Uh, no one has gone to jail yet, and I don't mean to scare you, uh, but the laws are on the books that if you know you have to report and you don't, you can go to jail. Uh, you can also be fined. Uh, 
in terms of civil penalties, the, the maximum penalty is not 10,000 as, as it appears here. It's actually 100,000 for each violation. And that's for each product out in the field. Say you've got a problem with a, a particular widget and you've sold 10,000 of them. It isn't just one violation. It's 10,000 violations. The maximum penalty is $15 million. I can tell you that the CPSC takes great pride in finding companies and takes great pride in putting on their website the companies they find. Uh, if you go on their website, you'll see uh, in May they find William Sonoma, almost a million dollars. In June, Ross Stores paid $3.9 million for failing to report. Uh, they would like nothing more than to find you as much as they could and to make an example out of you. You don't want to be that example. Criminal penalties. So far they haven't prosecuted anyone. They can fine you $250,000 individually. You can go to jail for up to five years. I suspect in our lifetime we will see someone prosecuted. It may depend upon some uh, who's in control at the CPSC, whether they want to make the, a name for themselves politically, and if the facts are egregious enough, uh, I think we will see a criminal prosecution. You don't want to be that first defendant. One of the prohibited acts uh, we all know that you can't sell a product that has already been recalled, but one of the permitted acts is knowingly and willful failure to comply with your mandatory reporting requirements. So what we're talking about today is deadly serious, uh, and you need to take it that way. Now, I will tell you that one of the difficulties with the, the criminal conduct and whether there are criminal penalties down the uh, future is the way the statute is written in terms of knowing and willful violation. No one knows exactly what that means right now. Even the criminal defense lawyers who from time to time you will consult with in cases uh, aren't sure exactly what it means. There haven't been any cases. Uh, no one's been prosecuted. Uh, there's very little legislative history. Uh, there aren't any statutes with similar uh, guidance uh, and so you're left with not really uh, knowing what to do and with little guidance. Uh, as a practice tip, uh, what we're finding more and more uh, is that many people who are genuinely concerned but not quite sure they have to recall are going to uh, their outside counsel and asking them, hey, uh, do I have criminal exposure here? Uh, oftentimes your CEO will be looking at the bottom line and making some of these decisions and that's just reality, all right? Uh, and, and sometimes it's easier for them to say, well, you know, we won't do it or we'll do it. I can tell you nothing gets their attention more than if someone tells them uh, they could go to jail. Um, but it's not just the CEO that has exposure here. Uh, this statute can apply to the president, officers, directors, managers, in-house counsel, possibly even your outside counsel. Uh, essentially anyone with decision making. So for those of you who are involved uh, in this uh, area, you need to be mindful that each of you has some responsibility and some obligations and some risk. And because of that, um, one of the things I hope all of you have at a company is a product safety group. If you don't have it, you should get one tomorrow. Uh, a, a group that's tasked with looking at these particular issues when they come up. Uh, and in setting up a group, unlike what we said before, there are certain things you're not going to want to put in writing and there are certain things you are going to want to put in writing. Um, for example, uh, you don't necessarily want the group to put in writing that you've all agreed to recall, and then the product safety group 
talks to your in-house counsel and, or the president, and the president says, what do you mean we're going to recall? Tell me the facts again. And the president says, no way. We don't need to recall that product. I don't think that risk is very high. Well, guess what? If you have another problem and you don't report to the CPSC, another accident, and you get a memo from your product safety group that says you should recall, and they ask you why you didn't recall, and you tell them it was the president who told us not to recall, they're going to absolutely kill you. Uh, you're going to be fined, and the plaintiff in the next particular case is going to have a field day. Uh, whether you should have recalled or not, you now have conflicting evidence within the company. So one of the things you need to do is make sure before you put a final decision in writing, which you're ultimately going to do, you need to make sure that everyone's on board with it and buys into it. That includes your highest decision maker. Even though that highest decision maker may not be on your product safety group, they need to buy into it before you make that recommendation. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for, for problems. Now, there are a number of different situations. There are a number of, of, of the close calls that are the most difficult. And there are a couple of different things you can do to minimize your risk. Because you really have two risks. The first risk is with the CPSC and the fines and the criminal penalties that we talked about. The other risk, of course, is the next plaintiff who's injured and the risk of punitive damages. And why didn't you do something about this? Why didn't you report it? Why didn't you recall it? Had you done that, I wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been injured. You didn't do it, now I'm suing you for punitive damages. One way to alleviate that is to go to the CPSC or the other regulatory problem, and we've done this very quickly, and say, look, we're telling you about this problem. We've had an incident or two, but we don't think it is an unreasonable risk. We don't think it's a substantial product hazard, but we wanted you to know. And if you disagree with us, you know, we'll talk about it. But here's why we don't believe it's a substantial product hazard. You know, in order for that accident to happen, all nine of these things need to happen, and that's very unlikely. We've had 10 million of these products we've sold. This is the first and only incident we're aware of, but we wanted you to know. So now you've reported it to them. So now there can't be an argument that you haven't reported. All right, and then later on, if there's another one, you can always go back and you can update them and tell them, look, we've had a second one. Uh, but now you have a complete defense because you've complied. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to recall. Sometimes you may decide, look, we're going to recall. You're going to report it, obviously. So you report and you recall. But I can't tell you the number of times we've actually gone to the CPSC and said, here's the issue. We don't think it's reportable. And they've looked at it. Sometimes they require a meeting and you send a team of lawyers and, more importantly, your engineers out there to meet with them. And they ask you questions and they seem convinced. There can be a variety of reasons why uh, you wouldn't have to recall. Um, it, there's another reason to think before we talk about Canada. Uh, another reason to, to think about your obligations very seriously, and that is you're probably just one of several in the food chain. And so you've got a manufacturer, a component manufacturer, a retailer, and a distributor. And someone else may report before you do. And if it's your product, you don't want the CPSC coming to you and asking you why you didn't report. You want to be going to them, letting them know that you have an issue. And so uh, you need to know who your customers are. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with a big box, for years, Walmart had a policy and other big boxes had a policy that whenever they had an incident, no matter how big or how small, they just report it to the CPSC. At, frankly, it was out of spite. Uh, they got tired. They got hit one time for, for failure to report. And so they said to the CPSC, okay, if that's the way you're going to play the game every time we have an incident, we're just reporting it. So you need to know that even if you don't report it, there may be someone else out there reporting all right, Canada. Uh, Canada is a big problem. 
I don't, anyone sell products to Canada? All right, all right. Um, Canada is a huge problem when it comes to your reporting obligation for a number of reasons. Uh, they just passed a law in 2011, uh, mandatory incident reporting. I would recommend everyone who sells product into Canada go to the uh, Health Canada website and print off this document, which is entitled Industries Responsibilities Under the Canadian Consumer Product Safety Act. You go to their website, you can print it off. Here's the problem with Canada. On the one hand, they say uh, that their reporting obligations is just like the United States. And on the other hand, it isn't. And you can call two or three different lawyers up in Canada and you'll get different opinions about your reporting obligations in Canada. And here's the bigger problem in Canada for all of us. And, and that was the prior heading, what happens in Canada doesn't stay in Canada. And that's this. You may successfully deal with the CPSC and convince them that you don't need to recall. You've reported it, but you don't need to recall. Canada, my experience has been they're much more aggressive about recall and much more likely to require a recall. And so you may report to the CPSC and just be fine there. As soon as you report to Canada, they're going to require a recall more often than not. Or I should say more often than the CPSC. So now you've got a situation where Canada is telling you to recall. What do you think the CPSC is going to do? They're going to turn around and tell you to recall everything in the U.S. And the reason Canada is such a problem is if you have an occurrence in Canada, an incident in Canada or anywhere else in the world, you're supposed to notify Canada. All right? Now, they say, well, but it's, uh, ours is like the United States. It's very similar to the United States. All right? But I want to give you an example. They say that, but then they give an example in this document. They call it a case study. And I'm going to ask you whether you think this is reportable. They talk about a control panel on a dishwasher that caught fire. Okay, this is the first time it's ever happened. Control panel on a dishwasher caught fire and burned the countertop. Okay. The user was able to extinguish the flames with no injury. First time it's ever happened, no other report. You think it's reportable? Everyone who thinks it's reportable to the CPSC, raise your hand. Who thinks it's reportable to Canada? Anyone? Raise your hand. Well, guess what Canada says? It's reportable. So that's what you're facing in Canada. Their view is that if you have a near miss, you got to report it, even if it's the first one. Even though here in the United States, most of you are familiar with the idea that if you have one incident, that's just one. It's, it doesn't establish a pattern or a practice. It may still require a recall, but generally speaking, most people you talk to, when you have one, it's, well, oh, let's wait and see. Let's look at it, but let's wait and see. Now, here's your other risk. Uh, that we talked a little bit about before, and, and, and that's the, the other thing that goes hand in glove with your reporting obligation. And that is whether you report or not, or recall or not, can have an impact on uh, whether you get sued for punitive damages if there is a second incident. So that's the other thing you need to be mindful of, because it's that second incident when you have that knowledge of the first they're going to say, look, you knew about this, and you didn't do anything. And that's a judgment call. Now, it's, after the first one, it's always very difficult to tell whether there's going to be a second one. And that's going to depend on a lot of different things. How many products you have out in the field, what's happened to them, how they're being used, internal testing that you might do. Uh, so that's always the quandary. You know, it's after the first. What do you do? 
sometimes you, you look at it right away and you know you've got a report. Other times, you're not so sure. Uh, and, and I can tell you there is no right answer. You know, I, I can't tell you. It all depends on your particular circumstance. But you need to know then that you've got the risk of the CPSC and you've got the risk of a second lawsuit. And you need to be thinking about that. Now, there are ways to uh, minimize that risk, certainly the cost of a recall, if you've got to do that. And I think that's what Colleen is going to speak about next. Uh, so with that, do you have any questions? Okay, so now that we've gotten through some of the basics on product liability law, um, what do, when a crisis occurs, what Patrick's observations and, and points on recall responsibility, I'm here to talk to you about what, what I hope all of us are, are, are invested to do now, and that's actually to think about managing your risk today. Uh, and so, I don't know if you paid attention to our metaphor, I kind of switched it up here. Uh, the, the seminar is called Weathering a, a Product Liability Crisis because um, when, when you're sued or you're facing a recall or other things, it is a crisis. Um, so now I'm switching it up to risk management for today's modern warrior. Um, as part of our gift to you, we actually have umbrellas. Uh, they take them home. You might need them in a couple of days. I hear we're supposed to have some freezing rain. Um, but, and, and I, even though I'm switching up metaphors, I, I, I didn't think handing out shields and swords were already approved by our marketing people, putting the Reinhardt logo on it. Um, but it's really just a tool, and I admit it's sort of a cheap shot or at least a, a cheap tactic to get you guys to, to uh, engage and maybe pay attention to some things that are not very exciting, like contract terms. Um, but it's really just, it's, it's thinking about your risk, right? And I think you're all here because you understand that even if you make a safe product and it's well made and you have warning, you can still be involved in an injury or an accident uh, that either injures a person or damages your um, I think you all could probably agree with me that good companies making safe products will get sued. Uh, if your product is involved in, in, in an accident that involves injuring someone, it is more likely that you will get sued than you won't get sued. Uh, we are just in a society where um, if someone is using a product and for whatever reason they get injured by it, you'll probably get a phone call. So, let's talk Army. This guy here is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. He is was a member of the 82nd Airborne. He jumped out of airplanes with a pack on his back over 100 times. He served on the DMZ twice, Iraq twice, Fort Hood, officer training. He spent his entire career thinking about how to defend this country, how to, how to react in a crisis. This guy's also my brother. Uh, so my parents have often thought, wow, you know, we've got at least we have three kids, and two of them went into very different fields. But as a litigator, I can tell you, I can relate to what my brother does. I mean, not on a combat basis, but on, on what we're doing in terms of thinking about strategy, thinking about shields and swords, thinking, thinking about things now to defend your product down the road. So when we think about strategy and planning, what's the best thing that can happen out of the strategy and planning that we do related to your product liability risk. Well, if we can win without going to battle, that's the best thing. If we can shore up your contracts, your insurance, your product, your warnings, where you don't actually have to engage in battle, well, that's the best thing, right? Well, what if you're involved in a lawsuit or a recall crisis? Well, do you have the defenses in place where you can win that battle? What if your whole product line is that issue. You have multiple lawsuits. 
where uh, plaintiffs across the country are attacking your specific product line. Um, you, if you've got things in place now, you can win the battle. So when we talk about managing your risk, I'm going to talk about it in a couple of different ways. One is building your fortress, okay? And the other one is stockpiling your, your shields and swords. So the overview of how we're going to talk about risk management is essentially four general topics. The first is your product, all right? Your, the design, the build, the testing that goes into it. Your chain, your, your supply chain, looking up and down your chain at your contract uh, in ways that you can mitigate and manage your risk. It may not eliminate your risk, but maybe you can put it on somebody else's doorstep. Your customers, your communications with your customers, whoever that might be, if you're a component supplier and you're supplying something that goes into a finished product, that's your customer. If you're a manufacturer of a finished good, your customers may be people like, like the rest of us, people out of the world that are, are buying, buying products. So managing the risk, the communications that happen, what you say to your customers and what you're hearing back, and then your partners. You know, your risk management is about aligning yourself within your organization and outside of your organization with partners who are going to support your mission. Um, if it's outside your company, it may be folks that are associated with the insurance industry who can guide you to appropriate policies. It could be your outside counsel. It could be consultants who you bring in from the outside to do analysis on, on safety on particular problems that you have. So, when we're talking about our fortresses, our tools, our weapons, our shields, if you, have, if you sell more than one product, then each product has to have its own fortress. So we're going to focus on the product. Um, we don't want to just have one fort, okay? The, the product might be in the middle. We want to have various things that support the product and investing in shields and swords. And we'll get into what that means, but it's not enough to make a safe product. If, if you buy into the principles that we started with, you make a safe product, a good product, you're a good company, your product may be involved in an accident. So what happens when the plaintiff's lawyers breach the wall? Um, you need to have things that you can defend yourself and, and shields, shields to defend yourself and swords to perhaps go after other areas where you can manage your risk. So if we're going to look at risk management, from your 50,000 foot level, we're going to talk about the product, uh, the design, manufacturing, testing, and warning. And if you don't have that, then we should probably just all go home. So I'm going to spend some time on that. Um, that has to obviously be individualized. But if you're not investing in the design, the manufacturing, testing, and warnings, um, there isn't anything that any one of us here can do in the litigation team to win that case if your product is indeed defective and has hurt hurt. Um, the other aspect of risk management when you're talking about product liability uh, issues is the, I call it the paperwork. Again, it's, a lot of it's electronic and some of it's not even paper, but it's things that support the product. Um, the contract, your, your chain, your supply chain, when's the last time you guys have looked at that? where you look at uh, what, what, what are you buying and what are you selling? What are your terms and conditions saying about managing that risk? Insurance policies, as Al pointed out, um, have you looked at them? If, if you're paying premiums on additional recall or other uh, uh, policies, you need to read them. You need to know what's in there. So that's an important aspect of managing your risk because I know there are people out there that are going to sell you a policy that fits you better if you actually have spent the time to look at it. External. External communications. Um, these are through your manuals, through your brochures, ads, websites, social media, what you're saying to regulators. All of that in terms of risk management um, is important because it's either going to help you defer or um, get out of out of a problem, right, or it's going to be good evidence for us when we're trying to defend you in a, in a product liability suit. And then your internal communications. We want to talk today about 
including in systems, creating a database, ways to manage information where you have it available, A, to figure out whether you have an issue with product liability, uh, do you need to recall, and B, again, giving us the tools when we need it uh, in a lawsuit. So we're going to spend a few minutes on the product fortress. I mean, as I mentioned, um, if, if you don't have the appropriate systems in place to develop the product on a design, manufacturing, and warnings basis, then the rest of this really um, doesn't matter. Let's get to uh, getting systems in place, managing your risk as it relates to um, your product itself. So as we started off the seminar, we talked about what is a defect, okay? It's, the law says it's unreasonably dangerous. And the three aspects or the three areas that you will see from a liability standpoint are design, manufacturing, and warning. Um, and so when someone is attacking the design of your product, they're attacking that, that there's something about it that made the product unsafe, okay? So what would be some risk management tools? What kinds of things do you want to have in place as it relates to the design of your product? Well, certainly you want to have protocols about the design itself, um, protocols that relate to testing. Is your product certified by an outside agency? Um, again, that's not going to get you out of liability, but if there are opportunities to sort of evaluate your design along the way by an outsider, that's very good evidence in, in a product liability suit, and it, it can help um, in the decision process on how you select your design. The product of regulated products, um, documents and reports that surround the design. You know, I think Patrick alluded to it, and, and maybe Al, and I think Jen did too. Um, you know, emails among the design team, or you know, the final design is is you know a dust trap. I mean, things that seem really obvious, but when you're documenting the design process, just having a sense within your own design team of what's appropriate, it, okay, um, and what's appropriate for discussions, you know, within within a group. Um, testing reports. If, if you can't design around a hazard, then maybe you can warn about it, okay, and we'll, and we'll get to that. But I just wanted to mention sort of in terms of the, the war stories, um, Patrick and I had a, a lawsuit where we represented a distributor of, a, uh, of sporting equipment, equipment that um, was used in the water, boating equipment. And the manufacturer of the product had sort of an unorthodox method of testing their design. Um, and that was to have employees of the company take this product um, and it, it was a inflatable um, flying, tube, kite. flying kite tube that you would pull behind a, a speedboat. And so they asked their employees, various employees, to test this product um, in various waterways. And so there were emails from various employees <laughs> including to the president of the company that said, just getting back from the ER, I am not going back out on the water again with this product. Okay, the design did not change. So, and, and this is a product that went into the field and was instantly, well, before it was actually being in, in use, it was getting all these accolades as being the sports product of the year. Um, it was distributed all over the country within weeks of people using this product in sort of the, the Memorial Day, you know, when people are getting the boats out, uh, there were, I think, approximately seven deaths within several weeks. Google Flying Elvis. Yeah, right. Google Flying Elvis is what Patrick said. Uh, and, and so our, our client was the distributor of this product, but because we were in the chain of distribution, uh, we were brought into multiple lawsuits. Um, so, the, the, obviously, I, I, I know you're laughing, so you're not going to have testing results like that. You're not going to have your employees trying out the product. 
but um, if you are selling to a manufacturer who does testing like that, you may be on the hook. If you're distributing a product from a manufacturer who does testing like that, you're going to be on the hook. So again, risk management, it's a very extreme example, but your testing and the protocols and the documentation that goes along with the design of the product are, again, part of your defense fortress. So manufacturing. Um, you know, documents and protocols that support good manufacturing. If you're manufacturing um, either a component that goes into a, a someone else's finished good or your own finished product, you know, what does your quality manual say? Your um, good manufacturing price practices. Um, do you observe uh, ISO, are you um, ISO certified? Those are the types of things that can help defend the manufacturing practices. It may not actually defend the ultimate product because remember, when, when a plaintiff alleges that there's a manufacturing defect, he or she is saying that something about the manufacturing of this product, this particular product or this lot, was, was um, defective. So again, if, if you're getting claims that come in, you would want to identify what the lot is, what um, your product in terms of its transportation, how it was stored. So I mean, there are many different documents and protocols and systems that can be employed that can help you shore up the risks associated with manufacturing a product. Warnings. Uh, this is something that I do fairly often for clients in terms of looking at warnings in, in terms of the development and the final product. Uh, and, and as Al alluded to, this is a very easy way for you to get tagged with product liability um, because you can have the squishy science, right? You can have the communications expert who comes in and says, yeah, I don't think that warning was effective. Or maybe you don't have a warning and they, and they can find someone who says, well, you should have warned. Well, what are the kinds of things that you can do now for risk management on warnings? Well, um, you're going to want to think about, do you even need to advise of, of an issue, of a, of a hazard? If the hazard is latent or hidden, then the law would say, yes, you do. Um, how do you even identify that? Well, you're going to kind of go back to your, your design team and talk to them about the testing and any reports that have come in about the product itself. Uh, in terms of the warnings itself, ANSI standards would apply, they're voluntary standards, uh, and it's the ANSI series uh, Z535. Um, they have some voluntary standards on product safety. They also include standards that relate to product manuals. So again, they're voluntary. But if you're sued in a product liability suit in this country, you want to say at a minimum you comply with ANSI standards. Um, if you sell outside of this country, ISO standards would apply. ISO and ANSI are very similar. So um, essentially you want to make sure that if you are looking at pro excuse me, warnings that are on your product, that they're very clear, that the, um, that the sticker is really on for the life of the product, that you can read it. Basically, can you communicate the hazard very simply and clearly to the end user? Um, if you're dealing with your manual, you can be a lot more descriptive. And we, you, know, you don't need to be short on words uh, there. You want to be very, very clear. So again, your product fortress, talking about risk management, there are systems, protocols, documents, procedures that can be put in place now within your organization that will help shore up your product, uh, should make it safer in the process, and not only give you the ability to make a product that is safe and effective, but to have the things in place that are going to be very helpful for us if you're involved in a lawsuit in terms of defending the product. Okay, so. You know, we, we were talking about our 50,000 foot. We, you know, here we talked about the product. There's so many more things that go into it and it's very individualized. I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about the paperwork, right? How can we create, give you the swords and the shields, the things that are going to help you manage the risk, perhaps put the risk on somebody else's lap, but 
different opportunities that are right there probably in your, your files right now that, that um, we can work on. So purchase orders. Uh, I, I put purchase order contracts. It's really uh, invoices, your uh, supply contracts, certificates of compliance. All of these documents can be involved or can be used by your company to, do, to protect it from liability down the road. Um, how you look at your contracts depends on if you're buying something or selling something. Uh, form contracts. I'm sure many of you have a very tiny uh, sort of form contracts that are on the back of your purchase orders or maybe accompany your invoices. Uh, if you have supply contracts, then it might not be so tiny, but there's the same types of provision. Um, in, for those of us who you know, endured law school, um, there's the battle of the forms. It's, um, it relates to if, if you're buying something and you have your form contract, and someone's selling you something and they have their form contract, it's the battle of those, those forms, of those contracts. And you want to be on the winning end, okay? So there are things that you can do now that will give you a leg up. Um, and if, if you are going to crash uh, and you, both, both sides are well prepared with their documents, then it's a good idea if you're going to continue to do business with that company that you actually work it out and you don't just leave it to, well, let's just see who wins. Because if you're on the buying side, end of it, you might be on the, on the um, better end of that, but it's best not to leave that to chance. So we're going to talk a little bit more about your PLs, your invoices. Implied and express warranties. This is where I really needed the metaphor because this stuff can get very dry. But um, if you're involved in evaluating the contracts that relate to your supply chain, um, this is, these are important things. And I, I'm not going to go over every type of provision. I'm going to talk about the provisions that relate to managing your risk. Um, so implied and express warranties. They're also called guarantees. Now, what are those? Well, uh, an express warranty or an express guarantee is what you say in your document. It's what I, we guarantee this product for one year will be free of certain defects. That's an express warranty. Implied warranties are warranties that exist and they're implied as a matter of law. And most states, including Wisconsin, have laws on the books that talk about what those implied warranties are. In Wisconsin, it's warranty of merchantability. It's that the product, the good that you're selling, is merchantable, that it's good, that it's not defective. Uh, fitness for a particular purpose, that's another implied warranty. It may arise in situations where uh, you're selling a product, or excuse me, you're buying a product, and you've told the seller about your particular needs, and, and the implied warranty um, places that, that the seller is um, guaranteeing, is warranting that the product will work. Uh, there, there may be some other implied warranties that are implied based on custom um, of, of um, practice or particular to your trade. So, again, if you're looking at your contracts, you've got to figure out where are in the supply chain. Are you out the buyer and you're looking at your implied and express warranties or are you the seller? Well, if you're buying, okay, you, um, and I've got an example here because I think it, it's a little bit easier to think about it. So if you're a supplier, you make a component part and you're supplying to a manufacturer who makes uh, that finished good. Well, then the supplier would be the seller, all right? And you'd want to minimize or eliminate the implied warranty. If you're selling a good, you want to just keep it to what you know, and maybe you just want to keep it to your express warranty. If it, maybe you want to sell it as it, I don't know if anyone will buy it, but um, as the seller, as the component manufacturer, you want to minimize, shrink down, or eliminate the implied warranty. If you're buying it, if you're the, the finished good manufacturer and you're buying the, the component part, you want to maximize it. I want all those implied warranties and I want the express warranties. So again, um, what the warranties do is it helps shift and manage risk within the supply chain. 
Does it mean that you're not going to get sued for product liability? No. Um, there are other provisions that can help that work with your implied and express warranties to, again, manage the risk. Indemnification. These are also called hold harmless. In indemnification, you're essentially asking or agreeing by contract that someone else <coughs> will really pick up the tab. Okay? Um, it, it shifts the potential liability from one party to two. And again, when you are buying a good, you want to minimize. You want to say, you know what, I'm not going to cover problems. I don't want an indemnification. Typically, if you're selling, you're the component manufacturer, and you're selling your good to a finished product manufacturer, I want to maximize that. I want to know that if I sell this dollar widget, and it's going into a piece of heavy equipment, that, and, and something goes wrong with that, you, you manufacturer, are going to indemnify me. And not just indemnify me, you're going to defend and you're going to pay my attorney's fees. Because uh, indemnification provisions are, are valid, alive, and well, but they need to be conspicuous, and they need to spell exactly what that means. Uh, now, obviously, the um, damages limitation is also a good way to shift some of the risk to someone else. Typically, in a damages case, you have direct damages, damages that would relate to maybe the cost of the underlying good would be a direct damage, and then consequential and incidental, incidental damages. Those are damages. Those are the big ticket items. Those are lost profits. Those are claims by third parties. Those are product suits. Uh, if you, again, you're selling the widget, the $1 widget, I will pay you if we get in a contract dispute, I'll pay you that, that dollar back, but I'm not going to pay for your lost profits when that machine goes down, and I'm not going to pay for the product liability suit that comes out of any defect with your finished good. So again, very important to know where you're sitting, and in your supply chain, you may be both buying and selling. Uh, and so again, you want to look at those provisions. Um, they need to be explicit. They need to be clear. This is not a time to bury it somewhere. Courts will enforce these, but only if they're explicit. Um, and again, there, it, this is kind of, it's difficult to talk to uh, sort of a group on. It, it's all individual, um, but these need to be carefully crafted. Now, there's a couple other terms from a risk management standpoint that I wanted to at least point out. Choice of law, venue. Um, you may be selling all over the country, all over the world. Uh, if, if you'd rather be litigating here in Wisconsin or wherever you're located, you better have that in your contract. Um, recall responsibilities. This might not be something that you would necessarily have in a form contract, but if you have a supply agreement, um, even if you don't have ultimate reporting responsibilities under a regulatory scheme, you might still want to know if your product's involved in a recall with your component manufacturer. And then ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. Do you want to fight about things in court, or do you want to do something through mediation or uh, arbitration? Again, these are ways to manage your risk, manage the expenses that are associated with product liability claims. Boy, I've I've got a lot to cover uh, in about three minutes. So um, another shield that we talked a little bit about would be your insurance. Um, again, the best thing you can do right now, if you don't know what's in your policies, figure it out. Look at it. Um, the one thing I do want to point out on this is the notice trigger. Um, if you get a call and a complaint about your product, you need to know whether you need to call your insurer the best thing to know is, the best thing to do is to have that handy. There are actually some policies that want, that where the insurer wants to know about a claim when it could be a potential litigation. Well, that could be anybody that's calling and complaining about your product. Um, a lot of people don't like to call their insurance uh, company on this. They think their claims could go up. Um, again, as Jen pointed out, we want to err on the side of, of caution. Um, 
External communications. Um, I mentioned this before. This is a really easy way for things to, to um, sort of get out of control. You, you spend all this time and energy, right, um, doing the technical and regulatory stuff. You, you, you have legal signing off on this. And then sales and marketing get involved, okay? I, I mean, some of the most colorful people that we've defended in depositions associated with product liability suits are the sales and marketing people. Bless their hearts, they're just doing, trying to do their job. But things can get out of control when it comes to the message about your product. And if you're facing a product liability suit, you don't want your sales and marketing force exaggerating what the product can do or diminishing risk. And this, this happens all the time. So again, when you're thinking about systems and, and managing what, what it means to um, you know, assess your risk, we've already talked about the manual and non-product warnings. You're going to go through an analysis, hopefully consult ANSI or ISO standards. Um, your communications with regulators, you want to be communicating to the regulators in the same format and with the same message as what's going on in your manuals and on your on your on product warnings. If you're involved in training or education efforts, safety bulletins, do you go in and talk to your customers, the end users, or send your sales force out to do it? Um, do they have documents? Do they have a little sign in? Keep those things. I know it can sort of explode and mushroom in terms of documents, but we've actually had cases where the actual plaintiff who has sued our company went to an education seminar put on by our client and signed in. And there's no better evidence for us than to slide that across the table at a deposition to say, that's your signature, and you heard about this risk, and you heard about that risk. Um, again, it, I'm not, you know, those are sort of the dream documents, but if you, if you do those kinds of efforts, um, it's, it's worth it to put systems in place to track it and manage it. Okay, I will cruise through. I've already made my, my piece about sales and marketing. Um, watch discussions about trade among trade groups too. Um, if one of your competitors is talking about a risk that could categorically affect um, your product, pay attention to those things. You want to be? Do you want to be responding, or do you want to be part of the dialogue? Um, you want to unify your external messages, like I said. Again, if you've got systems in place, make sure marketing sales and engineering, everybody's talking to one another. Communications are not a one-way street. They're going to come back. And Al mentioned this. If you're getting reports of injuries, of complaints, of product failures, how are you tracking that? Uh, if there has to be a system or a place in your company where that goes and that it's safe. Um, because that's how you're going to determine whether there have been problems before. It's going to help you determine whether you need to redesign the product. It's going to help you determine whether you have a recall or reporting obligation. Um, there's also communications that might not come at you, but that are about you. Um, blogs, social media, uh, Facebook pages. Again, do you want to know? Yeah, you do. You want to know what's going on. Even if, that, if, even if it puts on you some obligation to do something about it, it's better to know. Your internal communication, so many of the systems and protocols that you put in place on managing the external communications absolutely apply internally. Um, and again, it's really about creating an environment where your people are talking to one another and you're giving each other an opportunity to evaluate, are we getting reports of misuse? Um, misuse is fine if it's once, two, three, four times. Maybe we need to start warning because actually people are using the product in a way we didn't envision. Blueprint, blueprint your crisis plan. This is what Jen talked about. This, this checklist, we have one. We're using it. We use it. We're happy to modify it. It's not going to be personalized to you and, and if you want to drop your card off or just come see one of us, we'll email it to you. If you want us to customize it, we can. But we've got one right now that we're happy to just share in a generic fashion. Um, your response team, those are folks that are probably, many of you are sitting here today, okay? They're officially on the response team. Okay, so I think your defenses are ready. You've got your product, the various fortresses, the various shields and weapons and tools that you can employ to manage your risk. 
Um, I apologize for rushing through, but I, I appreciate that, that some of you have um, places to go, and um, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Got it all. That's great. Well, we're here. We're going to visit with you, uh, and we thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions for any one of us, you can either address it now or come see us. Um.